of all languages. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jake's getting creative today, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, you know, you never know what to expect Jake, you know. He's got so many talents that, uh, you know, we're discovering more and more every day. Announcements for today is, uh, well, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to uh, Pentecost, isn't it? Yes. Pentecost. Yeah, Pentecost. And you know what happened on the Pentecost? I wear red every year. <laughs> That's why. Look at how many people got baptized on Pentecost. So let's not us be afraid to go out and tell our testimony to people around us. Just like the apostles did and, and the disciples. Um, opportunities for the week. We got Bible study Wednesday at 6.30. We got the food pantry at 10 till 2 on Thursday. And we're going to have choir practice this afternoon, Jake? Yes, at 4 o'clock, choir practice this afternoon. Is there any other announcements that I might have missed? All right. Nora and Link, would you come down here, please? Last Sunday, we couldn't collect for Shelby, so we're going to do it this morning. This morning is we are going to recognize anybody that's graduating this year. And uh, Sydney, would you come up here, please? We have one graduate, one graduate this year. That's Lo Logan Wynn is Cindy's. Uh, yes, daughter. So, being Logan's not here. She graduated um, Friday night from Dodge County in Eastman, and she's on her senior class trip with her friends and their parents in Panama City, so Panama City. they're having wow. a good time. Awesome. And uh, she is going to Georgia Southern in the fall to study nursing, and she will become a nurse practitioner. So that's what her desire is now. So. And she also got a scholarship we're real proud of for good character someone that wanted to give it to someone who had made a difference in someone's life and she received that scholarship wow. so Wonderful. we're all real proud of her and she's a good little christian child and we're proud of that, so. you, tell her that you tell her that is very proud of her and wishing her the best of luck well, and hopefully she can come and say talk about herself all right thank you <laughs>
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for your presence with us this morning. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have to worship. Lord, we thank you for those who have fought for our freedom, those who died for our freedom, that we might come together as your people, that we might worship and praise your name, without anyone looking over our shoulders, without any hesitation. So, Lord, we invite you into our midst. May everything we say and do this morning be honoring to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and sing Spirit of the Living God, number 393. time we got the prayer list long term Bill Alford Terry Brown Ruby Cooper Becky Crosby Helen Durden Landon Hagwood Brenda Howell Barbara Knight Merlene Gay Lackey James Lewis Jim Moore Wes Moy Tommy and Debbie Shepherd Sonny Spivey Mary Helen Tapley, Billy Thomas, Lynn Thomas, Burnett Wilson, Burnett Watson, uh, Johnny Webb, Willie May Webb, Ryan Davis Wicker, Nancy Willis, Kelly Wilson, and Gene Yates. Short term is Larry and Debbie Reed, Deborah Harrison, Jay and Jessica Davis, Betty Collins, Betty McAfee, Joanne Leonard. Family of Jeff Gardento. Sally Jerry's, Randolph White, Faye Powell, Scott Clements, Tommy Crow, Ann Collins Stapleton, and Jean Marie Turner. Or Jean Martin Turner, I'm sorry. Uh, anyone else? Dad? All right. Great to hear that, Betty. <laughs> yes.
Landa Haywood has uh, his cancer has returned and he's going to be in in the uh, extremely um, co uh, chemo treatment so um, and radiation and he's a senior in high school he's a very young man to to uh, experience that so definitely want to keep in our him in our prayers anyone else Hmm. Beverly, would you want to say? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise this morning for all your answers to our prayers. Lord, you're so good to us. And we so often forget to say thank you. So this morning we come with grateful hearts, saying thank you for all your answers. And Lord, we lift these up who still have needs and ask for your presence, for your healing touch. Lord, to just be with those who grieve. Lord, those who are isolated and lonely today. Lord, for those who don't have a church family, who don't have a Savior. Lord, for those who have no idea where they're going or how they're going to get there. So, Lord, we just ask your presence, your guidance to show us all the way. Father, we ask your forgiveness as we fail you every day. Lord, whether it's out of stubborn self-will or just one of those things that we don't even think about, we pray for your wisdom and knowledge that we might follow you and know the way that you would have us to go. Restore us to that sweet communion you and the Holy Spirit. Lord, be with us each and every day. Shine your light into every dark corner of our lives. And now, with the confidence of children of God, we pray that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Just a little talk with Jesus.
جنگ برسه Our text this morning comes from the book of Acts. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 21 from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears him in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Ferva, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they had had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God. Thank you, God. Before you get started, is your microphone on? Technology and I have our problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, we do. So our text was from Acts, 1, Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. And we're talking about the power of Pentecost. Now, power can be used in at least two ways. It can be unleashed or it can be harnessed. Now, the energy in 10 gallons of gasoline, for example, can be released explosively by dropping a lighted match into a previously closed can with plenty of fumes. Or it can be channeled through the engine of my Honda out here in a controlled burn and used to transport me 400 miles. Explosions are spectacular in appearance. But control burns are more beneficial, have lasting effect, staying power. The Holy Spirit works in both ways. At Pentecost, he exploded on the scene. His presence was like tongues of fire. Thousands were affected by one burst of God's power. But the Spirit also works through the church. The institution, God began to tap the Holy Spirit's power for the long haul. Through worship, fellowship, and service, Christians are provided with staying power. 
The well-known author and preacher, Dr. Fred Craddock, tells a somewhat funny story about a lecture he was giving. It's a few years ago, and he was out on the West Coast speaking at a seminary. And just before his first lecture, one of the students stood up and said, Before you speak, I need to know if you're Pentecostal. The room grew silent. Craddock said he looked around for the dean of the seminary <laughs> and bailed me out here. <laughs> but he was nowhere to be found. So the student continued his quiz right in front of everybody. Craddock was taken aback and so he said, Do you mean do I belong to the Pentecostal church? The student says, No, I mean are you Pentecostal? So Craddock says again, are you asking me if I'm charismatic? The student said, I'm asking you if you're Pentecostal. Craddock came back and said, do you want to know if I speak in tongues? He said, no, I want to know if you're Pentecostal. Craddock says, well, I don't know what your question is. The student says, well, obviously you're not Pentecostal. And he got up and left. So what are we talking about this morning? Is the church supposed to use the word Pentecost only as a noun, or can it be used as an adjective? So I ask you, are you Pentecostal? Well, in spite of the fact the church doesn't know what the adjective means, the church insists that the word remain in our vocabulary as an adjective. The church is unwilling for the word to simply be a noun, to represent a date, a place, an event in the history of the church. Refuses for it to be simply a memory, an item somewhere back there. The church insists that the word is an adjective. It describes the church. The word then is Pentecostal. If the church is alive in the world, it is Pentecostal. Bishop Bryan has had his entire tenure as our bishop based on Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 on being alive together in Christ. So the South Georgia Annual Conference is Pentecostal. And you thought we were just Methodist. But how do we keep this aliveness, this fire burning, this spirit moving? What has to exist in us around us and through us if we're to be Pentecostal? Well, I think there's three things. First, we're to be in one accord. When the day of Pentecost came, we read that the apostles were all together in one place. This was the day that Christ had promised. And beginning with Easter, the resurrected Christ had appeared at various intervals to the disciples. They knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the eternal living Lord. Now he's ascended to the Father, and they've waited in expectation for what they knew not. How could they possibly have known that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was about to descend upon them? The result would be the beginning of the church. Pentecost became the primal fact of church history. They received God's power. But this power comes on a day when they are in one accord. That's the King James Version. In other words, there was unity and agreement. There was a commonality among them. They shared all things in common, we learn later. It's important to note that it wouldn't be like that forever. Later, a major split would occur in the church over who should get in. It's been said that Peter and Paul came out fighting and it's been going on in the church ever since. But in the that there's congregations around town that have the reputation for constant infighting and after, first, after 50 plus years of infighting, the United Methodist Church appears ready to split. Sometimes even the origin of the argument is lost over time, but they end up creating a poisonous atmosphere. Sometimes people love their ideas more than they love Jesus. 
Nothing takes the place of community. If we expect great things to happen, then we have to be of one accord. I'm going to say, I'm going to step away from my, my script here for a minute. Uh, something happened in, in uh, Coffee County. We had, ministers group had decided that we wanted to pray for our county. And we started meeting every Monday and praying for our county. Then we decided that we needed to involve the community. So we set a date in August uh, that we wanted the whole community to come together in prayer. We checked it out with the powers that be in one thing or another, and it was decided that we would meet at the courthouse on a specified day and that we would to one of the men figured out it would take 300 people holding hands to go all the way around the courthouse building. As close as we could get to the building with the shrubbery and all. So we started praying, and one of our meetings, somebody asked, well, what's our, what's our goal? We, we need to set a goal for how many people we're going to have. Well, one of them spoke up and says, well, you know, it's going to take 300 to get around the courthouse, so that would be, that would be a thing. Somebody else said, let's really, really ask God for something. I said, we know we can get 300 people to go around the courthouse. Let's ask God for 1,500. All right, so we started asking God. Every Monday when we met, we asked God for those 1,500 people that were going to come out to pray around the courthouse. And we kept on until uh, we had bought supplies, we had, we had candles, and this was going to be a, a candlelight vigil all the way around the courthouse. And we had talked to all the churches, even the ones that their pastors were not members of our association. And your thing went dead. My way. thing went dead. Oh, dear. Talking to nothing. Okay. Is this one on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Well, anyway, we uh, pointed night. We had a couple of three tables set up with candles and people asking people to sign in so we'd have some idea of how many people we had. God showed up and showed out. We had almost 3,000 people. We made the front page of the paper because of all the candles that we had lit after dark around the courthouse. And, of course, we had so many people that we basically just started a parade. And anybody that wanted to parade around the courthouse uh, just paraded around the courthouse. We had pastors there who, pre who said prayers for different sectors of the community, for our education system, our schools, for our churches, for... Oh, everything we could think of. We prayed for our law enforcement. We had one law enforcement officer who just happened to be a pastor. And uh, we prayed for them. And we prayed for everybody we could imagine. And we came together so well that it seemed we didn't want it to stop. So we made arrangements with the Board of Education and we rented the high school auditorium and for January before the kids went back to school they rented us the big high school auditorium and we only had one high school in Coffee County so it was a big auditorium and we had a seven day revival we had pastors from all denominations uh, we had black pastors white pastors Hispanic pastors we had every segment of the community represented and as far as I know they are still doing a revival every January because it brought the community together 
and it was something that they won't ever forget, and neither will I. It was amazing. But that's what happens when you come together in one accord. And that's what, that's what they're talking about. You come together in one accord. You're asking for one thing, for God to be there. Now, the second thing, and for this one, I have to slip back into chapter 1, verse 14. They all join together constantly in prayer. Prayer changes things. Do you know where the church is growing the fastest? It's not in the United States, but Korea, Africa, Latin America. For some years now, those, there have been massive revivals taking place in these southern hemisphere countries. Ask the Korean Methodist ministers, and they will tell you that the cornerstone of their revival has been prayer. Now look at the grapes in church history. John Wesley, Martin Luther, John Calvin, all were men of prayer. And while it is true that churches that are together in one accord can accomplish much, no church can be truly Pentecostal if it does not pray. It seems to me that much of the church has lapsed into a weekly routine of Sunday morning sermons and Sunday school. We've lost our desire to dedicate ourselves to prayer, expecting the Holy Spirit to move in our presence and change lives poem by an unknown author speaks of this. He says, I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't take time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me and a heavier became each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on, gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all of my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Too many people are trying to go it alone. Too many churches are trying to go it alone. They act as though the only thing that can occur with prayer is what psychologically takes place within a person. But, friends, if we're to come into God's presence... We have to ask to be in his presence. Just like any family relationship, our relationship with our Heavenly Father thrives on our communication with him. Would you expect to have a healthy and thriving marriage if you never or seldom spoke to your spouse unless you really, really needed something? No conversations about your day, no interest in their interest. That marriage probably wouldn't last long. And yet some of us want a healthy relationship with God, but without prayer. Talk to God about it. So we have a need to pray in order for God to order our lives. But there's another reason, and I think it's the greater reason. I want to read to you what the president said about our nation. We have been the recipients of the greatest blessings of heaven. We have been preserved in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom in virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient, 
to feel the necessity of redeeming in God, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Abraham Lincoln said these words proclaiming a national day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. Our need for prayer hasn't changed. Nations as well as individual people stand in need of prayer. Pray for guidance. Pray for deliverance. Prayer to shape us into people of integrity. Prayer to God to forgive us of our sins. Which brings us to our third point. If we're to be a Pentecostal church, we need to repent. If there is a moral crisis in the life of a person, he must repent. If there's a moral crisis in the events of a nation, that nation must repent. If there's a moral crisis in the life of a church, she must repent. Pentecost is possible only where sin is adequately dealt with. Peter, the church's first leader, understood this. In this very first sermon of the church, Peter reminded them of their most egregious error. God was at work through Jesus, Peter proclaimed to them. But you handed him over, put him to death, nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead and exalted him to his right hand. He then repeated the accusation one more time in, down in verse 36. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. When he'd finished giving his sermon, which takes up the last half of chapter 2, the people began to ask him, what shall we do? His response, repent. John Wesley preached more sermons on the text, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, than any other text. It is the bas basic requirement for entrance into the kingdom. But what is repentance, you might ask? Well, for these first believers, it was simply this changing their minds, realizing their error, accepting the one, the one they once condemned, becoming what they once ridiculed, receiving Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. That, my friends, is repentance. And it hasn't changed. It is by this act that we, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit through unity, prayer, and repentance, we can harness the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you again. Are you Pentecostal? Yes. Amen and amen.
May the grace of God our Father, the love of Christ his Son, and the communion of the sweet Holy Spirit rest and abide with you and appoint you for another week of ministry. For it's in the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Love one another.